like faith eludes me everything's been so confusing fear got the best of me now i'm lying here worried about tomorrow because of the weight of everything i don't know it's so heavy i can't sleep but the truth remains the same even when i don't know what to pray what i know is you my god are real no matter how i feel you've never let me go what i know is there will never be a day you're not just a breath away and through it all i've got a hold to what i could throw my fist in the air demanding answers but in spite of all my questions i'm still giving you my life and if it doesn't turn out like i think it should doesn't turn the fact that you're always good your ways are higher than mine and the truth remains to pray what I know is you my God are real no matter how I feel you never let me go what I know there will never be a day you're not just a breath Hey, good morning. How are we today? Oh, I'm glad. Hey, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to talk about experiencing standing firm all the way to the end. Let me tell you, have you ever been deceived? Tricked? Isn't it frustrating? Oh, man, I hate to get tricked. You know, I, I read a story this week, and it kind of made me think about the passage that I've just asked you to turn to in 2 John. Not the letter, not the gospel of John, mind you, but in 1 John chapter 2. And it made me think about, this story made me think about 1 John chapter 2. It seems that there was a zoo, a zoo in uh, China, a wonderful and awesome place to visit, I'm quite sure. They had a lion, and uh, this lion got sick. I guess that happens. I don't know much about zoos and veterinary science. Maybe some of you do and can fill me in later. But this lion got sick, and they decided that the lion was sick enough he needed to go to the vet and be out of the cage for a few days. And I guess the zoo was worried that if they left the cage empty with a sign that says, lion's sick, be back soon, or something like that, people would come back to the desk and say, hey, no lion, no money. Give me a refund, will you? I guess they were worried about that because they decided instead of being honest about things, instead of doing right and telling people the truth, they decided they would try to deceive. They decided they would take a Tibetan mastiff and dress him up like a lion. And so this is the animal that they put in the cage marked lion. It's not entirely clear how long the lion stood lion stood inside of his cage but the ruse was definitely over when the lion barked <laughs> i don't know much about lions 
But I do know lions don't bark. Anybody with me there? Lions don't bark, okay? Some people were then quite frustrated and did indeed ask for a refund because they'd been deceived. Can I just tell you today, church, it's easy to laugh at this and go, that's ridiculous. Who would fall for a dog dressed up as a lion? Who would be so silly as to be deceived by that? And then only when it barks do they understand just how tricked they've been. But there are a lot of people that are buying into deceptions that are just as dangerous, that are just as twisted, just as devious, and uh, intending to take people places that they were never intended to go. And it's only until the lion barks that they realize just how tricked they've been. When the apostle John writes his letter to us, in John, 1 John chapter 2, he wants to help us understand some things. And I want to help you understand those same things today. So with your Bible in hand, stand with me in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Hear what the word of the Lord has to say. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they really did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I don't write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It's the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it taught you, remain in him. Then jump down to chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've already heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God. And you have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Pray with me, won't you? Sweet and awesome King Jesus, thank you for your word today. Thank you for providing it for us. It's so timely. It helps us see our world through your vision. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to take it and use it as the filter through which we will understand how to live life. I thank you today, Father, that in it we find truth, not deception. And I thank you today, Father God, that your goodness is evident among all of us today. Speak to us now in this time we'll share together. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You might say, Darren, you know what? These deceptions you're talking about, dogs and lions and such, that doesn't really happen anymore around here. We're too smart for that kind of thing. You might congratulate yourself on your own good counsel and good wisdom, right? But I would submit to you that there are people who are perpetrating truths or half-truths or no-truths that are far more dangerous than a, a, a dog lion. Like this one, Jesus is not the only way to heaven. I hear that one way too often. There's more than one way to get to heaven. 
After all, your way, Darren, is so narrow and so confining. It's so intolerant. Or here's another one. Well, you know, Jesus was a fine teacher, but he isn't necessarily God. We can learn a lot from his teachings, but not necessarily have to abide by everything he says. Hogwash. You either take all of them or none of them. It doesn't come as a buffet. Here's another one that I really like. The only words that we really have to abide by in the Bible are the ones in red. That's a really popular one right now. There's even a group that's calling itself the Red Letter Christians. You heard of these knuckleheads? And yes, I did say knuckleheads. You can quote me on that if you'd like. Because that's exactly what they're saying. They're saying that the Word of God is only binding upon you if it's printed in red. As if the words of Jesus are somehow less inspired than the rest of the Bible. Or more inspired than the rest of the Bible. Be very afraid of that. Because it's a dog pretending to be a lion. Okay? It's a deception and a dangerous one at that. Because it will try to trick you into looking right. There are other groups, whole denominations, in fact, that found themselves on falsehood. You want me to call a name? Okay, I will, since you asked. Jehovah's Witness. They are a deception. They are a lie. I don't like saying that. It doesn't mean that I don't love them. I love them as much as anybody. But they've bought into a lie, and that deception is broad and encompassing, and it's destructive, and it's teaching people the wrong thing, taking them away from the truth instead of to the truth, capital V, capital truth, Jesus himself. Jehovah's Witness is teaching a lie, and we've got to recognize it for what it is and stop pretending that it's really a lion when, in fact, it is a dog. It's a deception. Let's not let it deceive us. You might say, but Darren, you're all talking about stuff that happens now. What about when John's writing? Why does he say this? Because there was a group doing much the same thing when he's writing. There's a group that called themselves the Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, the Gnostics. They believed that there was a way to get to a higher level of knowledge, and that higher level of knowledge didn't have material properties, so everything that did have material properties must be destroyed, must be dissolved, or is not to be holy including their own bodies. And so if Jesus came in the flesh, he can't really be the Savior. Can you see how dangerous that is? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> that's a big jump. Yeah, it is a big jump, but that's the one they were making. And they were deceiving a lot of people. So in 1 John chapter 2, our friend the Apostle John sits down to make sure those that are listening to him understand there are liars. And there's a lot of them and how they can understand the difference between truth and fiction. I want you to see verse 18, how he begins verse 18. It's exactly what you would expect of a pastor. Dear children, he says, can I just tell you something about being a pastor? My favorite day of the week is Sunday. I look forward all week long to getting to come and talk to you. It is a blessing. I love you as my church, and I love the fact God has called me to do this. When I talk to people outside of the church about you, I refer to you as my people because I feel a great deal of affinity for you, and I hope that's reciprocated. One of the things that I love about it, though, is the fact that God has made us a family. Good, bad, indifferent, crazy or not, he's put us together. John reflects that when he says, Dear children, I love you so much that I'm going to tell you the truth, even if it hurts. This is where we're going to pick up with the notes. If you want to follow along with me in the notes or in your bulletin when you came in, what you should know about the end. If you're an experience standing firm to the end, what you should know about the end. And that's where the Apostle John begins in verse 18. Right after he says, dear children, he says something important. This is the last Hour. And then to reiterate it later in that same verse, he says, this is how we know it is the last hour. What we need to know about the, the end, it's close. Real close. Now, 
I firmly believe after, after more than 20 years of, of study through the New Testament and, and through the Old Testament and all the, the, the fancy and, and fine learning that I've been blessed with, I firmly believe this. The Apostle John and the others who wrote the New Testament, they firmly believed that Jesus, whom they saw personally ascend into heaven, would be back before they died. They were convinced, I believe, that Jesus was coming back before they died. As a result, when John writes... The end is here. This is the last hour. He means literally the last hour. Jesus had this to say about his own coming. He said, I'll come when people don't think I'm coming. This is the last hour yet, John says, and we know it's the last hour. Now, I want you to imagine for a second, I want you to imagine that you were in my situation this weekend. We had some company come in from out of town. My cousin and his wife and their little girl came from out of town. It was a blessing to have them. Man, I love that cousin. He's a great guy. But you know what? We didn't know they were coming until Thursday evening. And so if it's true at your house, what's true at mine? What happened Friday morning is we got up and got busy cleaning the house. Anybody with me there? You know, here, Darren, here's a vacuum cleaner. You know how to use it. Make it go, all right? Here, Darren, change these sheets. Things we would never do for it was just us. Well, we had company coming, so hey, we got to d- gussy ourselves up. Now, I want you to imagine what you would do if that person coming was Jesus himself. And you had an hour to get ready. What would you do? Some of you would say, move. <laughs> but if you were really serious about it, what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming in an hour? What choices would you make? What would you say yes to? What would you say no to? That's what John wants us to realize. He wants us to realize the end is close. And that brings me to the second thing that he has in mind to tell you. Preparation is needed. It's one thing to recognize how close the end is. It's something else to do something about it. If you know the time is short, and it is, then what are you doing about that? The end is near, he says. The last hour is upon us. Well, Darren, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus ascended into heaven. How long is that last hour? I, you know, I, I can't really tell you. I don't know. But I know this. God sits above time, and because he sits above time, then time doesn't mean anything to him. So when he calls the end, though, there's a hard stop a hard stop at the end, when we will all stand before God and stand to account for our actions. And uh, let me tell you what won't get it done, all right? Doing great things, doing things that try to balance out the mistakes that you've made, doing stuff that you think is good morally, living a life that, that says you are a moral person, even, are you ready for this? Having your name on a church roll will not get it done. The only thing that will get you clear of that final judgment at the end is the name of Jesus as your own. His shed blood for you. That's it. So the only thing you can do to appropriate that is to call on him, confess him as your Savior, and accept him as your Lord. Oh, it can't be that easy, Darren. Well, no, it's really not. Because see, when you're his Lord, he gets to make the decisions for your life. And as Lord... He gets to say yes, and you go with him, and he gets to say no, and you don't go. That's what it means. So that's the kind of preparation I'm talking about, getting your heart ready for that hard stop at the end. Here's what he wants you to really realize, though. As you are getting ready, there are going to be liars. Liars will emerge. Verse 19, they went out from us, John says, but they really did not belong to us. So I'm going to lay out for you a few characteristics, four to be specific, of those who are the Antichrist. Now please observe, Antichrist is lowercase here. We're not talking about the beast in the book of Revelation or his buddy that wears the capital A Antichrist. We're not talking about those. We're talking instead about the little a Antichrist, those who are in the classical sense of this word, opposed to Christ. How will you know How will you recognize one who is opposed to Christ? I'm going to give you four characteristics of how you can do it. First of all, maybe, many times, they're from within. They won't necessarily be from somewhere else. They'll be from within us. 
I, I happen to belong to a wonderful scholars guild. It's a group called the Society of Biblical Literature. Uh, it's a, gr- a bunch of eggheads, PhDs and such, who sit around and talk about things that most people have no interest at all in even knowing about, much less discussing. It's a great opportunity. There's 10,000 of us worldwide, and uh, we meet together on an annual basis uh, somewhere here in the U.S., and then on, uh, they, they meet, I don't go to the international meetings, but they meet on an international basis another time in the year. It's a great opportunity to engage with those who study the Bible. Notice what I said, study the Bible, because one of our leading proponents in that, in that Scholars Guild is a man who doesn't believe the Bible is true. He didn't start out that way. He started out at a very conservative institution. He was raised in a very conservative church, named Jesus as his Lord as a teenager, went to school and got his training to be a wonderful trained Greek scholar. He is indeed to this day, and that's what makes him so dangerous. They went out from us, but they weren't really from us, John said. He's one of them. But if I were to bring him here and stand him before you and have him if I said, hey, here's what I want you to do. Just talk about the New Testament. Man, he's so polished. He's so smooth. Now, he's not tall enough to stand behind my pulpit. He's a little short guy. But he's so smooth and he's so polished. And you would go out of here going, man, that guy is so smart. But you know what? He's a deceiver. How do you know for sure, Darren? Because he's not leading people to the truth. He's leading them away. And what's he doing? He's teaching New Testament at a university. If that doesn't scare you, it should. Read it again, verse 19. They went out from us. They looked right. They smelled right. But they were not from us. They didn't belong to us. They were a dog proclaiming themselves to be a lion. Be cautious. Many times they're from within. Here's the second thing Apostle John says. Many times they are numerous. See it there in verse 18. As you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. Good gravy. Have people come out of the woodwork to proclaim Jesus wrong? It seems that way to me. Man, they're all over the place. Ah, Jesus didn't really mean that. The Bible's just been mistranslated. It's been misinterpreted. Oh, yeah, if we had the real copy of the Bible, then we'd really know what Jesus said. You know what? We do. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. And these antichrists, no matter how many of them there may be, they're wrong. They're simply in error. And I realize how intolerant that makes me. It's not me saying this. It's the Word of God. So if you got issues with it, take it up with him, not me. It reminds me ever more of the story I heard about two flies. They're flying around, and they look down, and there's some fly paper down on the table. And the fly paper has a bunch of flies that have already gotten stuck, and it looks like they're pulling. They're pulling to get loose. And the first fly looks down, and he sees them, and he says to the second fly, Hey, man, let's go down. They're having a dance party down there. It looks like fun. And the second fly looks back at him and says, you crazy knucklehead, they're stuck. They're going to die there. They can't get loose. And the first fly says back to him, surely all of those people can't be wrong. I'm going to join them. Can I just tell you, it doesn't matter how many people are espousing a particular view. If it's wrong, it's wrong. I want to give you a quotation from Augustine a church, church leader from the 4th century. Here's what he said. From the 4th century, mind you, wrong is wrong even if everyone is doing it, and right is right even if nobody is doing it. Man, was he ahead of his time. You know it. This is the reality that we face as believers in the 21st century. There are a lot of people, many of them even using the Word of God to tell us that we are wrong. In Areas wide and far. Most specifically, that Jesus isn't the only way to heaven. That there are lots of ways to understand other thinkings, other religions. That homosexuality is an endorsable lifestyle. That adultery isn't as bad as all that. That we just need to to drop all our narrowness and get on the program. Let me read it to you again. Wrong is wrong, even if everybody is doing, and right is right, even if nobody is. It's a hard word, but one that we must embrace, church. We've got to realize what's going on. 
And the reality is these antichrists don't want to lead us to Jesus. They want to take us away. How will we know them? What's another characteristic? Well, here's another one. They deny Jesus as God's son as well as Jesus' incarnation. See it there in verse 22. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. That term, the Christ, it's not Jesus' last name. Rather, it's his title. And the title implies a couple of things. First of all, it implies that he is the anointed one. Anointed with a capital A. Anointed, in other words, chosen. The one that was from told of ancient, that he would come and he would fix it. He would remedy our situation through his own body and through his own blood. The incarnation, Jesus born on Christmas, is what happens. That's when Jesus did that for us. He did something only he could do to remedy a problem that only he could fix. And that problem is us. Our sin problem. Can I give give you some more good news? Jesus, his death and his life and his resurrection mean you can be free. So if we are to take a bad turn and be an antichrist, then we're going to tell you something like this. Jesus is not the Christ. Either he didn't live or his life didn't mean anything. Or here's the byproduct of that. He was just a good person, a good teacher. C.S. Lewis, great writer from early part of the, the late part of the 20th century, he said this, either Jesus is who he claims to be as Christ and Lord and Son of God, or he's on level with a man who says he's a poached egg. There's nothing in between, because either he is Lord or lunatic. There's no other alternatives. So if someone comes to you and they say, hey, you know what? Jesus really isn't who he claims he was, then you can recognize them as an antichrist. You don't have to call them out that way. You don't have to hit them with your Bible. But you can say, I think I'm going to choose not to listen to that because it's not true. Here's another way you can recognize them. They deny the Father and the Son. Verse, 20, verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Hey, look at that. It's a two for sale. If you receive the Son, you get the Father and, we might say, the Holy Spirit too. They all come together. You can't divide the Trinity. If you're going to have one, you're going to take all of them. And to get one gets all of them. They deny them. Here's the problem that they, they, the Antichrist really, really have. They want you to be deceived because they themselves are too. So now that we recognize this and know what we should do about the end, what should we do about these liars? How do we handle it? Well, let's keep going in our passage. We'll start in verse 24. We're going to do this. We're going to remain in the truth. How will we know the truth? Verse 24. As for you, see that what you've heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Father and in the Son. And this is what he promised us. Eternal life. Ah, the end in mind. When you set out on a trip, people are on vacation right now in many cases, when you set out on a trip, you've got a destination in mind most of the time. Here's where I'm going. Well, that's where the Apostle John is pointing you. We're going to eternal life. This isn't all there is. We're going further beyond that. Here's what he wants you to point to. Remain. See it there in verses 24 and 20, uh, twice in verse 24. Remains in you. And if you do, you remain in the Father. It is a sit-down word, if you will. I'm not just walking through. I'm going to sit down and linger there. And I'm going to let the Father teach me because I'm going to sit at his feet. And I'm going to learn from Jesus because I'm going to listen to his word. Remain in the truth. Here's why I think Jesus, uh, the Apostle John, said this to us. Because he knew that in our culture, instead of remaining in the truth, many people would rather remain in the lie. Because it's easier culturally. It's easier emotionally. We don't have to fight that battle. Remaining in the truth is much more difficult. It's going to call us to some hard actions. 
Remaining in the truth means we're going to be countercultural, that our lives are going to stand out. And can I tell you, that's a good thing. Be encouraged by that. If somebody says, you're different, you know what I say? Thanks! And then I realize usually they're talking about how goofy I am and height and such, but what I'm hoping they see is that there's a difference between the way that I live and the way everybody else does. Here's the point I'm making. Remaining in the truth means I'm going to choose truth when falsehood is easier. I'm going to choose truth and stick by it even when everybody else says don't. Remaining in the truth means I'm going to ignore liars and the Antichrist in favor of listening to the one who's led me to salvation. I think you should too. Doing that helps us see the reality that God has painted for us. The reality of him guiding us, of him being our sustainer and not the world around us. Remain in the truth. Here's the second thing you need to do. Hold on to the foundational truth. See it there in verse 24 again. As for you, see that what you've heard from the beginning remains in you. Heard from the beginning. Things that you were taught. You know what? April 17, 1977, I came to faith in Christ. I was not quite nine years old at the time. And can I just tell you, man, my life, I had no idea where God was going to take me. But I knew this, the truths that my grandmother and my mother had poured into me now became evident as I realized my own brokenness, my need for a Savior, and the fact that Jesus died for me. Those truths are the foundational truths that have carried me along. What about you? All of us have something we believe to be true. What I'm asking you today is to look within you and ask what that is. What is true for you? Is it really true, like Jesus as Savior and Lord? Or is it a dog pretending to be a lion who's led you to believe something that's false? Let's say again something we say pretty regularly around here. There's three things that last. God, the Word of God, and the souls of people. That's a foundational truth. Here's another one. Jesus died for you. Here's another one. Jesus was raised back to life for you. Here's another one. He's coming back. Those foundational truths are the things John's saying, hold on to those, because here's what's going to happen. The waves are going to get high. And the water's going to get choppy. I don't know much about sailing, but I know this. I know that if you tie a boat to the shore during a bad storm, it will get beat to death because the waves will tear it up, banging it against the walls of, the, of the, the place where you're storing it. Rather, instead, if you can anchor it deep and moor it somewhere out where it won't bang into things, its chances of survival are much greater as a result of being able to move with the storm. The difference isn't the boat, it's the anchor. What I'm asking you today is, what's that anchor for you? The foundational truth. Here's the third thing that we do about it. Stand with certainty in God's anointing. This is for you that are believers. This is a word that's rooted in ancient times, and you go back into Old Testament times, then you'll see that anointing was something that happened on a regular basis. When God chose somebody, when God set them aside and made them holy, then they would do, go through a process of anointing where they would take a fragrant oil and they would pour it on the anointed one's head and that oil would run down and it would be fragrant and pungent and it would flow down over their shoulders and their chest and their back and their arms and all the way down and it would soak into their skin and that anointing would carry them forward and that anointing was something that they would be reminded of over and over again and that anointing would be something that when they went out people would say you've been anointed you have been anointed. Your life is not the same as it was beforehand. You've been anointed. That's what's happened to us, church. Because of Jesus, we have been anointed. It's been poured down on us. The problem that many of us have, we've been poured upon. We've received that anointing, and yet we've decided to cloak it because it's not culturally acceptable. It's not what people want to smell. You know what? It's time to stop that. Our world needs us to let them see that anointing. Can I give you good news? God delights in that. Hey, what are you doing up there, Donnie? Stop breaking it.
So here's what we do. We stand with certainty in the anointing that God has given us. See it there in verse 24 or 26. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive, past tense, you receive from him, remains in you. And you don't need anyone to teach you. But as, an anoint, as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it taught you, remain in him. Whoa! You see how many times he used that phrase, remain? He wants you staying close by. Because there is no place better and there's no place safer than in his presence. All right, here's what we need at the end. Chapter 4, we're going to jump down there. I know you've been here a while, so we're going to run on through this because I want you to see, okay, that's what we know about the end. What do we do about the liars? Okay, now, Darren, I get it. How do I recognize truth from falsehood? I'm going to give you just a couple of ways. First of all, verses 1 through 3. Let's read it again. Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone into the world. This is how you recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus as, is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've already heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Here's what he's warning you against. Smooth words. Don't be fooled by smooth words. Convincing arguments polished speeches. Can I just warn you against that over and over and over again? Because I want to tell you, Satan is no moron. He's going to deceive you any way he can. And if he can make it attractive and tasty and delectable and acceptable, then he'll do it. Don't be fooled by smooth words. Like my friend that's in the Society of Biblical Literature thing with me, you can be tricked into believing that a dog is indeed a lion. Our friend John says this, test every spirit. See it there in verse 1 of chapter 4. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. And then verse 2, this is how you'll recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. If they're saying something else, they're wrong. Write it down, underline it, underscore it. If they're saying something else besides that, they're wrong. It doesn't mean we hate them. It doesn't mean we discriminate against them. It doesn't mean that we're angry with them. They're just wrong. It's like some of you that love cats. I love you. You can have all of them. You can have my share too. You're just wrong, and it's okay. But it does mean here in this context that there are some things that are right and there are some things that are wrong. This is a cultural, cultural attack I'll make for a moment. We are told that there is no universal truth. We are told that there's no truth, true for always, 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 every person. It's a lie because here John presents one right here. Jesus is the Christ. That's an absolute truth. And you can like it or you can lump it. It's still true. What Jesus calls us to is to not debate its veracity, its truth, but rather to respond to it. We have two choices, accept him as Lord or reject him. Those are our only choices. Smooth words won't make it any easier. And then in the last three verses, he says this, you dear children are from the world and overcome them because the one who is greater, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. If you haven't underlined verse four already, do so, would you? They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to them. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Okay, so here it is, the last true test. How do we understand that? Well, it take, it, it's sort of like in chemistry class. They made us, oh, well, forgot my microphone's off. I hate being anchored, don't you? When, you, uh, when I was in college, they made us take chemistry, which I thought was an odd choice for people studying the Bible, but I said, okay, I'll take it, man. If I have to take it to get through, that's, that's good enough. And one of the things they taught us is in there is they said, you know what? If you take this test, this litmus test 
and you stick it down in some water, it will tell you the acidity of the water. It'll tell you whether it's just plain water or if it's muriatic acid or if it's sulfuric acid or if it's something, something far, far worse. It'll tell you how much acid content in that, in that so you'll know what you should do with it. Well, that's exactly what John does with us here. He says, here's what you should do. The spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood are not the same. And I want you to notice that in verse 6. Notice that spirit of truth, in my Bible at least, spirit is capitalized. Notice that now because that's not a typo. It's a person, the Holy Spirit. But the spirit of falsehood, it's not capitalized because it's rather a mindset. The spirit of truth is easy to spot because it proclaims Jesus as Lord. If it fails that, then it's the spirit of falsehood. It's a yes, no question, pass, fail, up, down. No other choices available. Well, but Darren, that's so narrow, that's so rigid, it's so hard. I know. But yet, we are called to it just the same, church. And not only that, we're called not only to accept that truth, but to respond through it. To, to respond to it. And so as a result of what we've heard, what we've learned, what are we to do now? Well, here's what we're to do. First, invite Christ into our lives. Surrender our lives to him. He paid for it with his own blood. So we surrender our lives to him. That's what we do first. Second thing, we take the first step of obedience and get baptized. That tells anybody and everybody, hey, you may have known me this way before, I'm different now. And it's not just because I'm soggy. The outside expression is an inside reflection of what God has done inside me. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that August 9th. Go ahead and write it down on your calendars now. August 9th. We're doing what we've come to call First Step Day. If you have invited Christ into your life and you've never been baptized, that day is your day to get it right. August 9th. We're going to do it at the lake. Last year, we did it at the lake and baptized 19 people. Man, what a day that was. We're going to do it again. Because here's the thing. We need more people that are willing to take that step. Not to make our numbers great. I could care less about that. But to help people take that first step of obedience. Maybe you're here today and you said, you know, I made a decision for Christ years ago, Darren. I never did anything about it. We had one last year like that. He made a decision for Christ when he was 12 years old. 62 years later, we baptized him. Wow. Man, I hugged that guy's neck when we brought him out of the water and went, you are an example. This is what God has called us to. But let me ask you, let me encourage you to not wait that long. If you've never invited Christ into your life, the first step is to invite him into your life. Second step is to get baptized. It's a reality that gives everybody else witness to what you have done. Here's the third thing that we'll do. We'll join together with Jesus and call truth, truth, and falsehood, falsehood. Here's another thing we'll do. We'll join with others in that same company and walk together even if everybody else says we're wrong. And here's the last thing we'll do. It'll take us a lifetime to get over this. We'll serve and love those around us, helping them see the same realities we've seen. People will not be won to Christ because we convince them with intellectual arguments or because we persuade them with Facebook comments. They will not be won to Christ that way. They'll be won to Christ by lovingly, graciously showing them the mercy of a Savior. That's how people come to faith in Christ. Can I encourage you today to realize what we're saying here today and just how profound it is? Not because I'm so eloquent, but because the Word of God is. There's a truth that we must grasp in order for us to be the church and the people God has called us to. And that truth is simply this. Jesus is Lord over all. And because he enjoys that title, because he is that, our response to him says what we believe about him. Do you believe that? 
Are you still buying into the idea that a dog is a lion? Pray with me, won't you? Gracious King Jesus, thank you today that you are indeed not a dog, but you are indeed the Lion of Judah. I pray today, Father, for those who are struggling with that very question about who you are and what you ask of them. And I pray today, Father, for those who are struggling with the idea of a truth that is so narrow and maybe even restrictive. I pray today, Father, for those who are struggling with communicating that. And I pray, Father, for those who have yet to receive your invitation of love. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would show yourself powerfully here and now, that you would make your name clearly heard among us, and that, Father God, what you do here today has more impact than just inside this house. That when we go out of here, that you change us from the inside out. May we permeate the world that you've sent us into with the knowledge that greater are you that is within me than he that is in the world. Guide us in this invitation time, Lord, for there are those who need to make a choice. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So here's your opportunity to respond. If you've never invited Christ into your life, you meet me right down here and let's get that done. Maybe you have realized, hey, you know what? I've never been obedient. I've never taken that first step. You meet me down here too. We'll get you fixed up. Maybe you need a church home to walk along with. You meet me down here and we'll fix you up with that too. Maybe you need to come to this altar and say, Lord Jesus, I invited you into my life, but I'm pretending that a dog is a lion and I need you to change that. Spend some time at this altar talking to him about it. If the Lord's prompting you to make a decision, don't wait. Do it now. Stand with me, won't you? Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. Speak that my soul may hear. Speak to my heart. I pray.